Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Politics Book 1, Aristotle is going to make a very fundamental distinction between four different types of rulership. He thinks that these are not only distinguishable from each other, so that we ought to keep this distinction in mind, but he also thinks, in point of fact, that many people tend to mix these up or to have confused and mistaken understandings about these, including, in some cases, entire cultures, entire peoples. So this is an incredibly important distinction with many implications, both for the politics as a whole and also for Aristotle's ethics. So it's very important to you know, make this distinction early on in the book and to follow out what some of these implications are. First, before we do that, though, let's look at the actual passage. It's very short where he brings this up. He tells us that people are mistaken who think that the, the nature or the structure, however you want to put it, of these four different sorts of rulership and, and the people associated with them are the same. We have political rule, the politikon, and that would be run by somebody who we translate sometimes as statesman or statesperson. This is a type of rulership in which citizens are engaged with each other and either vote somebody into office or choose them by lot. Power is being exercised over somebody who is recognized as, in other respects, being one's equal. Then we have monarchical rule. And there's different kinds of monarchies that Aristotle will discuss. And we could even think of, uh, you know, some other degenerate forms of monarchy, you know, that he discusses as tyranny as approximating this, basilikon, although in general we want to think of the good form of monarchy. And then we have what we can translate as household rule. This would be being head of the family or head of a entire larger household. That is uh, oikonomikon. And then we have masterly rule, the sort of thing that involves actual slavery, the despotikon. And this is a word that we get despot from. So you can imagine that this is not quite the same thing as monarchical rule. And he tells us that those who think that these are all the same are fundamentally mistaken. Now, who might be people who think that these, at least in part or even in whole, are all the same sort of power structure? Anybody who thinks that all power, by its very nature, is despotic, involves something like slavery, they would fit in with this. And in his own time, Aristotle criticizes the people who he calls the barbarians, which would include all non-Greeks and even perhaps some of the Greeks for Aristotle, quite frankly, um, because they don't recognize the fundamental difference between, as he says, a little bit, you know, inaccurately, women and slaves. So the relation between uh, husband and wife is for them, according to Aristotle, the same thing as a relationship between master and slave. The same sort of power is being exerted, the same structure of relationship, the same type of top-down rule is being imposed. And Aristotle says, well, see, this is an example of how the barbarians actually get things wrong. They don't real. he doesn't say that women are on the same level as men, but he does think that it has to be a different kind of rulership that would fit more into household rule or 
depending on uh, who the, the woman is and who the husband is, it could even be sort of like an analog to political rule, but it's mostly going to fit into this household rule. And he, he talks about a few other ways in which people often get this mixed up. He says that um, some people think that the difference between these various forms of rulership or authority is one of greater and smaller numbers. <clears throat> so as we move from, say, the master-slave relationship uh, or from the household relationship, which are on a lower level, up to the political level, uh, where we have an entire people or a political community underneath one person, several people, whoever is in charge, they think of this as just, you know, the, the household writ large or the master-slave relationship writ large so that everybody becomes slaves of the monarch or we're all part of, this is a very common phrase here over in America, we're all part of one big family. Aristotle would say, no, no, the political uh, community is not a family. The family belongs down here. And he would say the political community definitely should not be structured in the same way as the relation between master and slave is. These are fundamental mistakes in his view. So he says that um, as to the statesman or the political ruler and the royal ruler, they think that one who governs as a sole head is royal and one who, while the government follows the principles of the science of royalty, takes turns to govern and be governed, is a statesman. And then he says that's not actually true. You could, in fact, have a monarch, a single ruler, but it could be political rule. Think about you know, the office of the president uh, here in the United States as the head of state. Granted, there's many other things going on as well, but as the head of state, they are something like the Aristotelian monarch. But they are elected. It is political rule. Likewise, just having a number of people doesn't necessarily make it political rule. So there's a few other things that he says about this a little bit further on in Politics Book 2. He says we can use this, this mode of parsing these relationships out to understand the relationship between people and also parts of our own psyche or soul or personality, if you like. So he says, in studying human beings, we must consider uh, a person who's in the best possible condition in regard to both body and soul. And if we do that, what we're going to see is that the body is ruled by the soul. If, if things are the other way around, then the soul rules the body. For instance, people who are driven by addictions or who have moral vices or anything along, or people who are, lack self-control, anything along those lines would be problematic because the body is in charge. So he says, uh, the, the, the human being is a living creature and we can discern in there the rule both of master and statesperson. How so? says, the soul rules the body with the sway of a master in an ideal circumstance. That should be the relationship between the soul and the body, according to Aristotle. The soul commands, the body obeys. The body doesn't get to ask questions. The body doesn't get to make exceptions. The body is not part of the deliberative process. The soul decides and the body has to obey. Now you can say, what's the penalty if the body doesn't obey? And that's a little bit of a problem with the analogy there. With slavery, of course, if you don't obey, you, you incur some sort of usually bodily circumstances that, that are going to be quite horrific and are arbitrary. <clears throat> but notice here that Aristotle is saying there are some cases in which this sort of seemingly arbitrary, despotic use of power is in fact what is called for. We're going to see that not all slavery is actually just slavery, according to Aristotle, but that's a, a separate topic. What about the parts of the soul? Aristotle thinks that we have a higher and lower part of the soul. There's a little bit more to his anthropology than that, but that's enough for right now. 
how does the higher part of the soul relate itself to the lower part of the soul? Does it rule despotically or should it rule in a different way? He says that the intelligence, the mind, the intellect rules the appetites, the realm of the desires and emotions with a constitutional or political rule or with a royal rule. So these types of rule are not just about whether it applies to a whole political community. It's about the structure, the way in which power is being exercised and used. So let's think about this for a moment as we wrap this up. Despotic rule, slavery rule, very easy to understand. Some uh, people, that's all they view power as or authority as. Somebody commands, somebody obeys. If they don't obey, they get punished. That's a very low-level kind of relation. It's suitable for cases where uh, you really can't reason with the thing that is being ruled or the person who is being ruled. You can't reason with your body. You also can't reason with a computer, and the parts of the computer can't reason with each other. This is why you could think of the, the parts of the computer as in a master-slave relation to each other. Most human beings you can, in fact, reason with, and so different kinds of relations are required. Household rule, the oikonomike, um, oriented towards some common good, there is an imbalance in, in power, but it's closer than the master-slave relationship. There's also the possibility that, at least with some people in the household, similarly with the political rule, that people will step into new roles. Those who are ruled will eventually become rulers. As a matter of fact, one of the key things that Aristotle says, both about the household and about political rule, he really stresses this with political arrangements, is that in order to be able to rule effectively, you have to have learned how to obey and be ruled. That's part of the process. In the case of monarchical rule, ideally, it is being carried out for the good of all involved in the community. When that's not the case, when monarchical rule is solely being carried out for uh, the good of the ruler or perhaps his or her friends and family, then it actually starts to slide into a relationship of despotism. It, it quits being monarchical and it becomes tyrannical instead, which is essentially treating everybody as if they're slaves. Um, political rule is between people who are acknowledged as equals, all of whom are to at least some degree rational capable of deliberation, perhaps together, perhaps on their own, and they take turns according to some sort of constitution, some sort of arrangement, something that allows them to say this is actually a fair use of power. Now, we could think about all sorts of other cases and see if we can apply Aristotle's viewpoint to them. Think about, for example, a workplace. Is a workplace more like master-slave relations, more like a household, more like monarchical rule, or more like political rule? It really depends on the workplace, doesn't it? A co-op, for example, would be political rule. Uh, a terrible workplace to be in would be masterly rule. A family business may in fact be part of household rule and may include other people who somehow come into the family as well. It may also be monarchical rule. Think about when you have a large corporation with a board of directors and a CEO at the top and all sorts of layers of hierarchy. So each of these would have its own demands and its own way of structuring power and relations and what people can expect in the framework of these. In, a, in a political rule, you can expect a lot more than you can in despotic rule. 
Likewise, household rule in, in relation to despotic rule. So it's very important to get this distinction down when going into Aristotle's politics, but it also has some very important implications for Aristotle's ethics as well.